All right. So what do we got for you? So what we're going to do is talk about um, console and data dog. So specifically kind of service mesh. So how do you kind of monitor distributed systems? Um, a lot of folks I'm sure will have, will have heard of um, service mesh. It's fairly inescapable um, if you kind of have a Twitter account or anything like that uh, these days. But there's a, there's kind of a, a number one reason I think why the service mesh is important. And, and I think against all of the detraction, for me, a service mesh is kind of an essential piece of infrastructure. And the kind of the core problem that, that I see is that as we're building more and more distributed systems, we're, we're kind of not even just distributing them across a single cloud. We're distributing them across multiple regions in a cloud. We're distributing them across multiple clouds. All of that adds to a huge amount of complexity. And, and kind of one of the key things is that networks are not 100% stable and, and often experience transient failure. So even if your application is perfect, the, the network within which it's running is, is probably not. And, and you know, don't take my word from that because there was a paper from Microsoft Research which um, was entitled The Achilles Heel of Cloud Scale Systems. And kind of one of the core concepts was that was that Microsoft looked at, at the Azure environment and they looked at many of the problems that they were seeing with their own in, internal systems. And they kind of said like that the major available breakdowns and performance anomalies we see in cloud environments tend to be caused by subtle underlying faults. So gray failures rather than fail stop failures. So kind of taking the computer science out of that, what they're sort of meaning is it wasn't application crashes which were causing many of the, the faults, but it was kind of a gray failure, so a connection failure or um, IO failures, things, things like that. To kind of dig into that, you see things like performance degradation. So the underlying network can reduce in performance. That can cause timeouts and things like that in your application. You can get random packet loss, again, causing sort of network performance problems. Memory pressures on, on the cloud, especially if you're running in kind of um, on multi-tenanted environments and, and those non-fatal exceptions. All of those things that you, when you're building a distributed system, you've got to really sort of think about. So you, you start getting into the realm of reliability and to do reliability, you've got to be thinking about observability. So traditionally that all gets lumped into your application code, but what a service mesh sets out to do is to, to kind of think of it as, as a sort of a layer on top of that networking infrastructure. A service mesh attempt allows you to kind of offset all of those reliability and give you some additional observability. And I say additional, I'm gonna come back to that, in, in an application of its own right. So Console Connect is a service mesh. You have Istio, which is a service mesh, and you have Linkerd. I'm obviously gonna be talking about um, Console today because I work for, for, for HashiCorp, but the kind of the concept behind console is that it gives you uh, a service catalog. It gives you the ability to run a service mesh. And it gives you the ability to kind of fulfill a lot of the things that a, a distributed system needs when, um, when it, it's running in a, a cloud and in a multi-cloud environment. So we're gonna specifically be talking about the observability piece today. And, and as I kind of alluded to earlier, observability leads to reliability. You absolutely cannot do rely, build reliability into your applications and, and have things like retry patterns and effectively configure timeouts unless you truly understand what's going on. Service Mesh also will give you um, additional security. You get encryption and transit and things like that. And there's a, there's a bunch of additional uh, resources from, from ourselves at HashiCorp. If, if those things are of interest to you, um, we can direct you to, to those. So Service Mesh. The Service Mesh is predominantly broken into two components. Now, we, we see console as the control plane. So you have the control plane and the data plane. Where we, we kind of say that console is like a single control plane for cloud networks is that it spans multiple cloud networks. So you can actually run console in GCP, you can run console in Azure, and you can run console um, in, in AWS and also bare metal. 
and connect all of those systems together safely and securely. Where that comes perfectly with Datadog is that you've got a single point of collection for all of your observability data. So your, your logging, your metrics, and your, your tracing. So the, the, the control plane, so what, what do I mean control plane and data plane? So the control plane is the, the, the kind of the thing that handles things like service communication policy. It, it controls the security within the, the, the service mesh. And it allows you to configure all of these different data planes. So it allows you to configure whether you're using sort of reliability patterns, what type of protocol the service is using, you've got this ability that you can control all of that centrally without having to kind of have sort of distributed application configuration for, for those things. I suppose the, the thing that does a lot of the hard work is the data plane. So where in a standard sort of application, your, your microservices or your application services are talking direct to one another. So you make an API call from service A to service B, that communication goes direct. When you deal with a service mesh, it doesn't. What you do is you proxy all inbound and outbound traffic through the data plane. And because you're doing that, what the data plane can do for you is it can allow, it can handle things like authorization, your request tracing, you can do things like traffic shaping if you wanna do sort of canaries, um, load balancing, service discovery, circuit breaking, retry logic, so kind of some of the, the typical reliability patterns. And it means that you, you're handling that with configuration rather than code. So it's um, a really, really nice tool. The other kind of thing to kind of think about when you're dealing with a, a service mesh is, is service discovery. So for, for folks who've maybe kind of using service discovery in a microservice environment, if you're using Kubernetes, you'll be used to using potentially just Kubernetes DNS, core DNS. So you'll, you'll just reference the, the service name itself. If you've been using console in a virtual machine environment, what you potentially be doing is using console service catalog, and then you might have something like a console template, which is providing those endpoints to your application. And then you're actually, your application is doing the load balancing internally in a client, or you're using centralized load balancing with something like HAProxy, Nginx, or, or, or something like that. With the service mesh or with console service mesh, we take things differently because you don't need to worry about load balancing or actually where a service resides anymore. Because again, we've got that data plane, which is handling all of that communication for you. So your application just talks to localhost. So what you do is you, you configure the services that you, you want to communicate to. So in my example here, I've got um, a service, which is a MongoDB instance, and I wanna make that available to my application. So I, I can configure console and I can specify that I want my MongoDB service to be available on localhost 8001. So my application, if it needs to talk to MongoDB, which could be in a completely different cloud potentially, it doesn't have any knowledge. It doesn't need to, to worry because all we're doing is talking localhost, which is a really, really nice convention. It makes configuring and retrofitting a service mesh into your application really simple. So for folks who are using Kubernetes, and you, you might sort of look at that and go, well, why not just use Kubernetes services? They're, they're as simple a convention. Well, the, the reason we don't take that approach is because console service mesh runs on Kubernetes, but it'll also run outside of Kubernetes. So we, we can't adopt the Kubernetes um, convention because you might not be using Kubernetes. In all honesty, I, I think this is a, a nice, um, a nice, easy approach. And um, whether it's localhost or a service name, it, it doesn't uh, make a great deal of difference to the configuration of your your underlying application. Oops, I got one screen too. Oh, my word! I've gone way too far. I pushed completely the wrong button on my computer. 
Right. So let's look at that connection a little bit more in, in depth. So how does it work? So the, the, the proxy or the data plane is, is aware of the service catalog. So console maintains a service catalog in the, the console server. And you don't ever talk direct to the console server. What you do is you talk to the console client. So the proxy is talking to the console client and that's gonna give us resiliency and it's also gonna give us performance over a, a, large, a large estate. So when web wants to talk to MongoDB, it makes a request to the proxy. The proxy will obtain the, the location of the, the physical location of the MongoDB uh, proxy, always proxy to proxy from console. So the, the two proxies, the two data planes are talking with TLS. It's actually MTLS. Um, so in addition to being encrypted traffic, we're using MTLS or mutual um, TLS to be able to do an identified connection. So if, if the destination proxy or MongoDB instance doesn't uh, um, recognize the certificate, which is presented to it, it won't accept the connection. And then that gives us an, an additional layer of security. We layer that up again with, with some um, policy-based stuff, but we're, gonna, we're predominantly talking about the observability. So that connection is, is established. The, the data plane is gonna use all of the, the, the best sort of practices around connection pooling and persistent connections to ensure that you're, you're kind of not slowing down your requests too much by having to establish um, TLS connections every time. And it's gonna do that authorization that I kind of mentioned. It'll then talk to the database, which is connected to it. And you've got that seamless process. So the database is not aware that there's a service mesh in, in anywhere. The website is not aware that there's a, a service mesh in front of the database. It all just kind of happens transparently, which, which allows you to kind of make your, your, your applications um, slightly simpler. But observability. So observability is a, a kind of a, a, big, a big deal. Um, a lot of people, kind of think it's maybe just a buzzword. And uh, I'm gonna put my, my hand on my heart and say that, I, you know, I thought it was a buzzword too when I first heard the term, but it, it really isn't. I mean, I've been using kind of metrics and, and logging for a long, long time. So this, this observability, I'm like, well, do they just mean metrics? Is it just kind of, but it, it's not. I mean, the, the term itself comes from um, control theory and, and it kind of the states that, you know, observability is a measure of how well internal states of a system can be inferred from knowledge of external outputs. And that is really helping you, isn't it? Ultimately, what it means is that you're pulling together a number of different sources which describe the health of your application. So things like system metrics. Now, that could be um, network speeds coming from your, your links. It can be your node CPU, node memory, um, disk space, you've got things like your, your health checks coming from your services, um, application tracing, you've got access logs and, and application logs, and then your sort of more things that you'd be more used to, like your application metrics, um, and, and, and additionally, business analytics. So business analytics, but in my previous life, when I worked for a, an, an organization, we used to use um, sales as a metric of system health because we, we kind of knew where the sales should be for any given day. So therefore, if they were beneath what our estimations were, we would potentially start looking to say, well, is there a fault with the system? Is the system not processing enough transactions? And, and observability as a term kind of tries to encompass all of those things rather than just kind of sticking on um, application metrics. So those failures, how can we use all of that information? Well, we, we kind of look at a full system failure, like a crash, that's, that's fairly easy to, to spot. And um, 
the kind of the core problem is that we want to be looking for the more subtle failures. So are we suffering retries in our application and why are we suffering them? Is it because there is a, an unhealthy node? Is it running too high CPU? All of these kind of types of failures, when we take an observable approach as opposed to just a kind of a very sort of um, isolated approach to our system, we can, we can get much richer value. It's, it's also really important to look at layer seven because we want to be kind of looking at obviously connections and requests. But, you know, when you're just looking at pure connections, it, it, it's sort of a, it depends on what sort of protocol you're using, but a fail request might not just be a, a disconnect. You know, you've got to be looking at things like what are the protocol HTTP response codes? What are the GP, GRPC um, response codes? And we need to be able to, do, to sort of have access to that and, and have to be able to easily measure it and to be easily present it. To. So how it, how it works from, from what you would kind of ordinarily have with your application is, is not so different. So the, the, the sidecar proxies, the data plane, emits metrics. So the types of metrics that the sidecar is going to be emitting are things like your reliability information, whether there's been any retries, you can get information about the, um, the HTTP requests or the TCP connections, gRPC requests, things like the, 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 the size of the data payloads, the response codes, because the data plane understands the, the various protocols. One thing I want to mention is that your applications still need to emit metrics. So the, you know, the, the, the service mesh is going to do a lot for you. It's going to allow you to shift a lot of the, the information that you're collecting and manually hard coding in your application um, but it won't do everything for you. In any case, all of that information is passed to the Datadog agent, and the Datadog agent is gonna forward it to the Datadog API that you can then sort of um, do all of your discovery in the dashboards. So not so dissimilar to the way that you would ordinarily use Datadog with your application. So the service mesh really is not a silver bullet, and one of the things that kind of you see, I think misquoted quite a lot is that from an observability perspective, you switch on a service mesh and you've got absolutely everything. You're gonna get metrics and you're gonna get tracing and I'm gonna have all of the information that I need for my application. You're not. It's gonna give you a lot of information very, very easily, but it is not a direct replacement for your kind of very granular application metrics that you're currently emitting. I like to kind of see it as that the, the service mesh will kind of tell you where something is going wrong, but it might not specifically tell you what. The what is generally better to be sort of formed out of application metrics. You can kind of get stack traces and things like that from your logs. From a tracing perspective, and we'll, we'll look at this in a little bit, but you still have to put tracing code into your applications because the service mesh can't automatically kind of create the hierarchies of um, spans which are needed. So Daniel, I'm, I'm gonna sort of, uh, I've probably bored these good folks for, for way too long with, with slides and they're probably itching to look at some, some, some demo. So let's, um, let's have a look at that. Um, just before I throw over to you to kind of show us some, some of the dashboards and, and um, some of the, the, the fantastic tooling within Datadog, let me just quickly describe our system. So what we've built is a, a demo application and um, I've got a link that you can download this and, and play with um, on your own. But um, we've, we've built it really, really simply. Um, so what I have is a Docker Compose file, which has got a number of services in it. So I'm running console service mesh and I have my web service. So I, I don't have a real web service. I'm, I'm using a, a tool called fake service, which allows me to kind of just model a, a system, but we've got a web service and the web service talks to a API service. Now, again, that's talking through the data plane. 
The API service, again, hierarchical multi-tier application is going to talk to our payment service and it's also going to talk to our cache service. All of the services that we have modeled here are using HTTP with the exception of the cache, which is actually HT, uh, sorry, gRPC. Cache service, there we go, gRPC, and we have our payment service and our payment service talks to our currency service. So there's a quite a few layers, layers deep here. The, the interesting thing I, I find about this sort of like um, service mesh is like, do you need a large system to use it? Absolutely not. I think you can get a, a lot of benefit even if you only have a few services. So Daniel, do you want to kind of um, give us a bit of a deep dive on how all of this wonderful stuff looks and uh, some of the, the fabulous metrics that we're, we're configuring, uh, sorry, we're, we're capturing in, in Datadog. Yeah, that sounds great. I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Super, all right. Well, hey, hi everybody. Thanks for coming out. My name's Daniel. Um, I'm out of, uh, out of Paris here <laughs> today. I am uh, with Datadog and I would like to show you a little bit about uh, everything we've been talking about in terms of observability and metrics and all that, that good stuff. So we're gonna start here with looking at uh, some dashboards. Now, dashboards are oftentimes the first place people will go when they're looking to understand what's going on inside of their systems. If they can understand what's going on inside of their software, it's perfectly normal, right? And what's cool about it is if you've got some pre-existing infrastructure, you've got some pre-existing services that are running, there's a good chance that you're running some standard software, right? You could be running like MySQL or, you know, sorts of things that are common to the world of modern applications. So in our case here with our demo app, everything's inside of containers, so that's Docker. We know we have console, which Nick alluded to earlier. And as you can see, right by default, Datadog is gonna provide some dashboards for you. So this is not something that we built by hand. This is actually just something that Datadog detected. They went, oh, I see you have some Docker there. Why don't I give you a nice screen board to let you understand what's going on with all of your Docker containers and the deployment in general. So this uh, particular screen board is meant for a screen that is wider <laughs> than the one I happen to have in front of me right now. But as you can see, if we scroll to the side, there's tons of great information that you just basically get right out of the box, which is super, super cool, right? Things like input, output, it's your network information, right? The most intensive containers, which can sometimes be very, very difficult to figure out manually, we'll just surface that right away, which is really, really nice. A lot of cool information in here, but that's actually not what we want to dive into. So let's actually take a look at the dashboard that uh, Nick and I <laughs> created earlier. You can actually see over here, Nick's uh, lovely visage. Uh, he was the one who initiated the dashboard, so he's got to have his little face on there there. We click on this and we've got it organized into a couple of sections. And each of these sections relates to the services uh, that we are running. So we have a web service, an API service, and a payment service, and a currency service. And these are just the elements that were reflected in that configuration file Nick was leading us through earlier. So if we take and we expand these, we can actually take a look at some information about what the service is doing, right? What, how is it acting? What state is it in? Is it healthy? Is it not? Let's find out. So we see here the web service is processing a number of requests per second. In this case, it's a little under one, that's fine. Uh, we see the responses, the average request duration here. And as we scroll through, you can actually see that uh, my mouse is sitting over top of points and it's giving us some exact information. And it updates over time uh, every five seconds or so. You may notice that there is a graph here which says no data. And you think to yourself, hmm, no data. Does that mean something's wrong? That's what I thought too the first time I saw this. And then Nick was kind enough to point out this is in fact errors per second. And so if there are no errors per second, there'll be no data. <laughs> so everything's working just fine. Good to know. So let's take a look down here at our API service. 
And we can see here that it shares a fairly strong correlation with our web service, right? It's processing a number of successful requests per second. We have a similar duration. We can see visually that those two things share a relationship, although they don't line up exactly. And that's normal, right? Because uh, each, each layer of the service is going to respond in a slightly different way to each request. But as we can see here, there are also no errors, and that's good. And as we continue to scroll through this section, we also get an understanding of um, the number of requests that are moving through the different layers, um, uh, which are related to the API itself, right? So that's pretty cool. And we can see here as we move through time, um, we know what our response codes are and so on and so forth. And that's, that's pretty neat. Go through our payment service again. Looks very, very similar, so we'll just sort of skip through it. Everything looks fine so far until we get to the currency service. And so we'll expand the currency service, and immediately we see, uh-oh, right? It's big and it's red. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see something big and red on a dashboard, that generally means something's up, right? So you have the errors per second. <laughs> it's actually very similar to the number of successful requests per second, you know, which is curious, right? And so we'll take a look down here. We can actually see, uh, yeah, okay, we're throwing some 500s. We're throwing some 200s. Okay, so clearly something is, is going wrong there, and we'd like to know a little bit more about it. We can also look over here at our request duration, and we can see that while certainly some of the requests, the median of the request is good, we, we are having these sort of spikes. Why are we having these spikes, right? there's another thing that we want to investigate and, and know more about. And then finally, we'll look at this last graph here. And this shows us, from the service perspective, the number of um, status, uh, sorry, info status level uh, requests versus the number of error status level requests. And we can see here that, indeed, we are throwing errors on a fairly regular basis even though we are still successfully processing requests also on a fairly regular basis. Now, uh, stepping away from this for a brief second, you're looking at this and you think to yourself, well, that looks kind of funny, right? It's up and down, up and down, up and down. Down here, it's up and down, up and down, up and down. And they look static. And this is actually just an artifact of the, um, the way that our, our fake web service is designed. We've configured it to um, throw errors at a set percentage of requests. So here, the, the artifact as a result is something that looks uh, fairly static over time. In the real world, it probably wouldn't look like this. Although, of course, you know, your systems are your systems. <laughs> they may, in fact, look like this. All right. So we're curious about maybe what's causing this problem here, what's causing these latency spikes over here. And, and that's something that is, is worth digging into. So for example, we can take a look at this and we click in directly on the graph and we can see, oh, look at that. We can see the processes that are associated with it. Maybe we wanna take a look at the hosts that are associated with that metric. Or we also might wanna take a look at the logs that are associated with that metric. So we can see we can move directly to understanding our application stack in a variety of different ways. And this touches on what Nick was alluding to earlier about observability. It's not just enough to monitor and alert on metrics. What's important is to be able to move dimensionally through your application stack and, and try to understand it in a variety of different ways. So we'll take a look here at the perhaps logs associated with this particular error. And we move from the dashboard directly to the log explorer. The log explorer is basically exactly what it sounds like, right? Logs get sent, logs can be coming from anywhere, from syslog, directly from the applications, et cetera, et cetera. And we immediately get an understanding of what's going on. Well, clearly we've got some errors, right? And we can see them graphed up here. So we can click on the log uh, entry itself and have an immediate context and uh, raise that information visually without having to dig too far. So we can see here that it, here's our host, happens to be a, you know, a desktop machine, thank you, Nick. 
<laughs> that it's the currency service, although we did know that ahead of time, so that's good for us. What container that the service is running in, and the Docker image, just in case that helps, because it might help to know how this was deployed, what was deployed. We have any number of tags that are going to be generated from uh, the data itself. Some of it is tags that we can import from the infrastructure, from the deployment, so on and so forth. And some of it's going to be tags that uh, you're going to be adding or the person who created the application is going to be sending along. We can see immediately here that it's an error message and what the error message actually is. Now, for the case of our you know, dummy application, our error message is service error automatically injected. In the real world, it would probably be something like currency API failure or you know, who knows what, right? Cool, okay. So from here, we might go, well, we've got the log message and that's nice to know, but it still doesn't tell us exactly what went wrong. So from here, we can actually take and look at the request itself. We're now we're going to moving into the application performance monitoring tracing aspect of things. Now, if you've played with this before, you might know where I'm going with it. For those of you uh, who are perhaps not as familiar with the world of APM and tracing, you're going to get something that looks like this. And it, the idea, and this is a very simple one to, to introduce everybody to it, is that you'll actually look at the request itself and how long it took what it was interacting with, if indeed it was interacting with anything. And we can actually take and analyze the substance of the request. This is different from logs. Logs give you sort of an event in time. This is actually telling us something about the request itself. We can see what component it was, request ID, in this case was an HTTP request. So was it a post, was it a get? You see the URL, of course. This is all super critical. Um, you know, which is, which is really, really neat stuff, right? Right on. So this is a particular trace, as I said, which is a simple one to sort of get us into the idea of what traces would look like. This particular trace doesn't tell us too much because it was a 200 okay. So let's actually take a look at some traces that have errored out. So we just click on here and we'll look for some errors. We know that our currency service was erroring out. So let's take a look here, for example, at an errored out trace. I'll make this a little bit smaller so we can actually see everything that's going on inside. This is a slightly more complex uh, trace analysis, but the principle is the same. The idea is that we're actually going to be looking at every layer of the stack as it moves through the various services, call and response, how long it took to execute each of those steps. And we can learn a little bit about what each of the steps entails. Everything looks good here so far, right? We don't see anything that's popping out at us right away until we get here. And it's a little perhaps small to see on your screen, but there is the dreaded red exclamation point. The red exclamation point generally means a problem. So we're going to click on that. And I'm going to raise this a little bit up here so that we can whoops, see what the issue was. This is the error itself, right? So we've surfaced the error message. In our case, it's error true. Again, this is a dummy service. In the real world, you might have something a bit more complex here. And we can see exactly that what request it was, what node it was interacting with, et cetera, et cetera, which is actually really, really cool. We can also click across here to the full error view. In case the error message itself is insufficient, we can get the full trace very directly available to us. And this is really, really great if you're an SRE, if you're a developer, if you're anyone working with code, this information being able to get surfaced and, and visualized to you right away is, is just splendid. You can also take and look at the logs that are associated with this trace. We can see here the relationship between logs and traces, right? One log doesn't necessarily mean one trace element and vice versa. So this trace has a number of log entries associated with it. One of the things I mentioned earlier about observability was the notion of moving dimensionally through your systems and dimensionally through your data. And this is much of what we're talking about here, right? Is, whoops, is 
your logs are great and your traces are great and your metrics are great, but the real power is when we can start to correlate and move through these things in an organic way. And I think that's actually quite powerful. All right, cool. Uh, Nick, did, is there anything that you wanted to uh, jump in and talk about uh, this stage of the game? Yeah, why don't I um, just dig in a little bit and, and show, some, show some code to kind of just further illustrate some of those examples. So one of the things that, um, that, that Daniel was just showing you is this, this dashboard here. Now, when we're looking at things like this upstream request, this metric is not actually coming from my, my application. This metric here is, is actually coming from the Envoy proxy or the data plane. So Envoy understands the protocol and it, it gives me the ability to, to kind of query on a number of different metrics. So I can see things like upstream requests, I can see connections, I can see things like the, um, the, the number of sort of bytes received and, and transmitted. All of those metrics I'm getting for absolute free because I'm just sending that information through um, Envoy Proxy. One of the things also that's worth interesting to, to look at is the, the reason that we're not seeing any errors up here, but we are seeing errors down in our currency service is that we're using service mesh reliability. So our um, currency service has been configured with retry policy. So what's happening there is that the, when the payment service makes a call to currency, if that fails, it's automatically going to retry it n number of times. Now that retry logic, again, it isn't in my application. It's externalized into the service mesh's data plane. From metric stance, I can see that I've got this metric here, Envoy cluster retry up, tr upstream, and I can see the number of times that my data plane is trying to, to um, reconnect. And it's only going to retry on a, on a failure because I've only got it configured for 5xx errors there. But that, that's all like pretty amazing. Again, just on to quickly onto the, the trace list, we're getting all of this information for, for free just by using the service mesh. So what you're seeing here in the trace is that we've got the web. The web has a span, which is to call an upstream. That upstream is the, the API, but it doesn't go direct to the API, it goes to Envoy. Again, Envoy is going to add a bunch of information automatically to me, for me, to that span, such as the protocol and um, uh, the response size and, and stuff like that. It then comes into my application. My application again calls call upstream. And you know, you can kind of see what's going on. Now down here, when we get the payment service and it has a failed request to the currency service, you can see that Envoy actually twice makes a call to currency because that's that retry logic in, in action there. So we've got failed request, it's gonna back off a little bit and it's gonna retry um, a couple of milliseconds later. So what's, what's important when you're, you're kind of thinking about those things is the, the kind of the way that you build up your, your, your traces. So I've, I'm just gonna kind of quickly dig into my, my application code, but my, my kind of main request handler comes in here. So I'm not, I've, I kind of, I like to put a, a library in my code, which kind of moves all of my logging and all of my metrics and all of my tracing out of my main application code. So it just keeps things cleaner, but I'm, um, I'm kind of logging that I'm handling an HTTP request. So what's going on in that sort of logging handler? Well, what I'm doing is I'm creating a span. So in, I'm using the open tracing protocol, which then uses the, the Datadog API and uh, the Datadog SDK. And I'm going to create that span. 
because all of those elements that I want to kind of be able to dig into, so I'm making a database call, I create a span. If there's a particular element or function within my application, again, I create a span and that allows me to build up this, this rich picture with all of this information and, and timings, which helps me to do all of that debugging. In terms of the metrics, I'm not outputting anything other than a very, very simple kind of histogram here. All of the kind of the, the information around the HTTP request, let's say the, the request size, the number of connections and things like that, a lot of that I can offload into the service mesh and into the, the data plane. What's important, and when I mentioned earlier on, in that a, um, a service mesh is not a silver bullet, is that when you look at this chart and you see things coming through flowing here from call upstream and into the data plane, so the data plane is going to obtain the span ID, which I'm automatically, I'm, I'm setting when I create my, my span using the Datadog API SDK. And it can use that span ID to create its old child span as we can see here with the egress and then another child span with the ingress. And then ultimately that ends up in, in handle requests. So the next service is call. In order to keep that chain flowing, what I have to do is I have to create my, my span for my new service, but I'm going to use the HTTP headers which are passed to me, which contain the information of a, a parent span. The service mesh can't do that for you. So in the instance that I didn't do that, even though all of my further upstream communication is going through the service mesh, when I get to this point here, if I hadn't have picked up the parent ID span from here, it would have kind of just um, gone into thin air. So it is giving me a lot of information, but I still need to augment my application code um, using the, the Datadog SDK and spans because that's what allows me to build a richer picture beyond what's just going on with the network. From a gRPC perspective, um, gRPC actually works in, in exactly the same, well, very similar way. Uh, with gRPC, obviously you don't have HTTP headers because you're multiplexing on a single HTTP2 connection, but what you do have is metadata. So the same span ID and, and metadata about the, the parent span is actually embedded inside of the gRPC metadata. And I can kind of very simply just extract that and use that to um, create a, uh, a, a child span and keep that, keep that right the way flowing there. I'm trying to think if there was anything else, I think it's probably best to just ask the, the audience here if they have any, any questions about what, what's going on or if there are any elements that we can um, discuss further in, in depth. What do you think, Daniel? Yeah, that sounds fine to me. So maybe while we're waiting for questions, I will just kind of quickly show you some of the, the, the console configuration. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. I'm configuring my service mesh um, using um, this, this configuration. So I have my console configuration. I can specify my Datadog agent. Um, address for console itself to allow that dashboard that Daniel showed you. I can then specify things like my um, control plane configuration, which is automatically going to get sent to every control plane, so I don't need to reconfigure everything. And again, I'm setting my, my metrics output and my, my tracing output. So tracing spans go over HTTP, but my um, Metrics, my stat, dog stats D is going to go over UDP. I set that up there. All of the, the kind of the information for my, my upstreams, you can kind of see here, I, I showed you a, a configuration a little bit um, earlier on, but it's pretty straightforward. I just literally define the service name and I define 
the um, the local address that I want it to be to be available uh, available on, and all of that information is just coming from my console server here. Further configuration of the the service mesh. So, for example, I can specify the protocol, and um, and that's kind of really important to allow the the control plane to be able to decode the information that's going on in there. And um, that retry logic, well, again, I'm, I've got that decentralized reliability within my service mesh. So I'm, I'm just specifying all of that information um, in my, my configuration, which I pass to this, the control plane, and therefore um, everything gets uh, sent, sent down. Do we, uh, do we have any, any questions? from anyone. Looks like I've got a Q&A button here. Oh, maybe not. Hey, if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and leave them in the Q&A box down below and we'll get them, get to them. So anything else that you'd like to uh, maybe show off, Nick? Or maybe we could um, pull back the curtain a little bit and show how uh, logs and, and traces actually get connected together. That sound good, Nick? Yep, sorry, I was trying to get my, my thing off mute. So this is a really important point. Um, so again, like how do you connect metrics and tracing together? Because it's not going to happen automatically because again, the logs and the spans are getting emitted at a similar time, but there's no correlation. So what we need to do is we need to sort of manually define that um, correlation. So here when I'm, um, when I'm logging, what I'm actually doing is I'm, I'm just using a utility function. So the, um, I, I apologize if the, the code is confusing, but um, I'm using a, a package in my Go code here called HC logger. And HC logger takes a log message and then a bunch of metadata. So to, to get that metadata to allow a correlation between the span ID and the, um, the, the, the trace ID, what I'm actually doing is I'm adding the, the span ID and the trace ID from the, uh, the tracing context to my log message. If I look at that inside of my um, log itself, you can see here that I've got span ID. So this is allowing um, Datadog's uh, application APM to be able to present all of the, the sort of the associated log files with, um, with my trace. And it's a, it's a very simple, um, simple thing to, to do. The, the docs are actually really awesome. Um, and I found them very, very helpful um, to, to sort of set those things up and, and configure them. But, you know, there's, there's very minimal sort of things that you, you do have to have to do to get um, get things set up. My application really does not log um, a great deal. I've kind of okay, fair enough. It's pretty pretty simple, but um, I'm just doing things like dumping out the the request and uh, which is great for debugging um, and things like that. Speaking of requests, Nick, uh, just a quick question. Uh, talking about retries, you know, a retry strategy, right? You know, right now we've got it set for, for two, right? So if it fails, try again type of a deal. Uh, what happens if it fails the second time? Should we just error out and, and abandon hope all ye who enter here? Or do we just want to keep retrying? We talk about back off strategy. Yeah, so it's, I mean, a retry for me is, um, is, a, is a kind of an alert because I, I wouldn't want my applications to be constantly retrying. You can kind of see from the trace there that it, it's increasing the duration of, of the request because it, it is kind of waiting for a set interval before it, it retries. 
Now, the retry is protecting the end user, and that's really important. But, but as a metric, a retry is a warning to the SRE team or to the development team that there is a problem with their application that they should get to quickly, or that problem can potentially sort of escalate. How you kind of find the, the appropriate values for retries very much depends on, on your system. Um, I recommend sort of load testing and performance testing as, as a really good way. So manually stressing a system and trying to find I'm not sure the, I understand. Because I didn't ask you a question, Siri. My word. Um, how you um, kind of set that, but you do it through performance testing. You've got to stress test your system to understand where it breaks. Now, you can look at the, the normal operating conditions and you could maybe apply a retry as a, as a sort of a temporary patch, but you know, a retry should be an exception. It shouldn't be the norm. You, you want to kind of use your application monitoring, use your application tracing, and use it as a discipline to ensure that your, your application is, is well performant, good behavior, um, and that ultimately benefits the, um, the customers. If I kind of set it to a, a level which was, was too low, um, so let's say if I increase the number of um, errors which are raised from my system, and again, I've got my, um, my dummy system here, so I can set this from 40% to 100% errors. Let me just quickly stop and start that. Then what's going to happen is you're going to start seeing those traces and they're going to start um, catastrophically failing. So you, you know, you're not going to get um, anything which is, um, which is running through. So if Docker wants to die properly. And we'll see that just in a second as that um, application restarts. But, you know, reliability patterns, you form them from observability. So I don't, if I have a, a failing service, I don't want to continually keep retrying it because continually retrying it can actually make things worse. It might not be completely broken. It might just be busy. The box which it's running on might be saturated from a CPU perspective. So I can employ sort of strategies such as um, circuit breaking or, or outlier detection as they're, they're known in an Envoy world to, to kind of temporarily give relief to failing services or con continually failing services in the intent that they recover by themselves. Sometimes, of course, it's just application bugs. Um, not me, I write perfect code 100% of the time and all of my past colleagues will testified about I'm positive, like. Having worked with you on this application all day today, I can attest to your code being 100% perfect. 100% perfect, because I um, classify bugs as, um, as part of my, um, my perfection process. Nobody can write perfect code, but, but I think the key kind of point that I tried to allude to earlier on is that, you know, ultimately, even if you do write perfect code, the environments which we're running in these days are, are subject to transient failures. So you could lose a network link or there could be a problem routing to a particular region or, or something like that. We can see here, there you go. You've got um, all of the, the sort of, everything is just hard stop failure now. So um, that is absolute worst case because now my customer is receiving error messages, whereas before I was able to mask it because the errors were, were somewhat transient. We're pretty much at time. Um, is there any other bits and pieces that you'd like to cover, Daniel? Um, if anybody maybe wants to have a play with this little example, they can, um, they can find that at um, github.com slash Nicholas Jackson slash fake service. Uh, there's a folder called examples and in there you'll find um, Docker Compose Datadog. And um, there's, a, there's two examples in there, one without service mesh and one with um, service mesh. So you, you should be able to run that on your machine. I've got a very modest MacBook 
um, which is capable of, of spinning all of that. All you need is a, a trial or a full account from Datadog and an API key. There's um, instructions there in the readme. To, to be clear, I do not recommend running this in your production Datadog environment. So if you want to play around with this, and I encourage you to, because it's actually a really fun learning tool, feel free to fire up a trial account. You can play around with that for 14 days and uh, don't pollute your production environment with dummy data. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, this, will, this has been recorded, so we'll, be, we'll make sure to send it out to you via email. So keep a look for that in your inbox. Thanks everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you, everybody.